Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to a series called Even the Darkness. Even the Darkness. And what's that about? Well, we have two classes on the topics of spirituality, the Bible, emotional uh, well-being, and mental health challenges. And the title is taken from Psalm 139, where the psalmist writes, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the night become night, uh, the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. So sometimes we're in the dark. Uh, sometimes that's practical. But here it's poetic language. And I think that refers to a lot of the kind of other areas of darkness that we experience. And some of that is emotional darkness. And some of that is darkness within mental health. We can't see the way out. We can't see how how is God going to work in this. And sometimes when we're in that dark place, we wonder whether God cares. Any of us who struggle significantly with anxiety or depression or perhaps with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or any of those things, there can be the the sense, is God with me? And it's further compounded, that challenge, by the fact that sometimes we as Christians don't know how to help people, don't know how to be appropriate around people going through these issues. And sometimes the, the tendency can be to just label it all as sin, which is not kind and loving and not even true. I mean, it's certainly true that all the problems in our life are the result of the fall in that sense. But just because someone is having a mental health challenge doesn't mean that they've sinned more than you or me. Thus, how do we address these issues? So these two classes, I think, will help. They certainly won't cover everything, but I really hope they will help because God is in that darkness. He's with you and me when we're in the darkness, whatever that darkness is like. And he's with us as we help people and show God's love to people in the darkness. So these two classes um, are interviews. The first one is with my old friend, Jim Pickett. Some of us might know Jim. He and his family were part of the Cambridge Church for a long time. Now they're in El Paso. In those days, previously, Jim worked for the United States uh, military and was, I think, 35 years or so working there. These days, he's finishing up his master's in counseling, in particular in the areas of marriage and family therapy. And his thoughts on the best way for Christians to help other people, I think you'll find are very helpful, full of insight, and Christian compassion. So I commend to you my interview with Jim Pickett. You know, mental health has always carried a stigma about it that people don't want to talk about and people don't want to address. And even my email to you, I, I, I certainly believe that there were instances of mental health depicted in the Bible, even though they weren't directly, you know, saying, oh, this person has depression. This person has anxiety. This person has a psychosis. Um, but I think there there are instances there that were addressed that we can apply to. And with that, I, I think we need to overcome those stigmas and be able to talk about mental health more openly. Um, and certainly from a, a person that doesn't have any mental health background uh, to, to help others, those people I'd encourage to go and take a couple of classes, go and investigate uh, mental health to be able to get a background in it so they can readily identify uh, people that are struggling with severe mental health issues that they can say, you know what, this is out of my ballpark. You know, let me help them, you know, direct them to somebody else that can help them more adequately. One of my own experiences, uh, discipling back in the day, uh, I had one uh, disciple in, in our congregation that suffered from bipolar, uh, being bipolar. And everybody was, you know, saying, well, you know, that's just sin. He needs to come out and, and work, you know, harder with it. And it's like, you, you don't work harder with bipolar. You, you got to get treated for it. Uh, you mentioned there about it going on a course. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of thing you do? What kind of people do you think would benefit from a course like that? Anybody that has any type of interest, any type of care, especially in the church, that we want to help each other out. You know, just taking an introductory course and understanding mental health uh, would be would be greatly beneficial for anybody. A course I did 15 years ago now, I think. I think it was run by a mental health charity called, I think it was run by Mind, okay. which is a mental health charity in, here in the UK. And they did a first first aid, mental first aid course of role play, uh, instruction, discussion groups, 
and and I learned a lot that day. Mostly what I learned is I don't know anything. <laughs> really. <laughs> right, right. I don't really know what I'm doing when I'm addressing mental health or emotional health issues. Uh, but it did it did make me more aware of and alert to signs and yeah. my own limitations and made right. me more sober about what I can do and I can't do. But for a non-trained person, just an average member of our congregations mm -hmm. who's with somebody who's very troubled, what would you suggest might be some things to bear in mind regarding helping that person who's troubled to feel like they can they can be themselves and and the person who's listening to, to really listen well are there some particular ways of being uh that would help someone to feel listened to so if i'm i'm the person listening you know how can i help the person who's troubled to to feel listened to and to feel like you know the word we often use is safe hearing their story letting them guide where you go with it don't try to guide, you know, a specific aspect. Oh, I want to get them to this point. There's going to be key words that they're going to probably repeat over and over again. And if they do that, certainly you can key in on that word and say, okay, you brought up this word, you know, a couple of times, help me understand what, wh why you're focusing on that word. What, what meaning does that word have for you? And they'll, they'll stop for a minute and they'll look and they'll realize, wow, I have been focusing on that. And they'll think about it for a minute and they'll start thinking about it and they'll start talking about it. And then you just sit there and listen about that too. It's really all about them. It's not about me. Because for me to suggest, okay, you need to do this, this, and this doesn't make a difference. But if they come up and they say, oh, you know what, maybe I need to do once they have a realization of what they need to change, it makes all the difference in the world for them mm. because they're the ones that made the change, not me. Help me understand what you're feeling. You know, help me to see what you're experiencing and then sitting back and listening to what they say. Silence is part of listening. Yes, absolutely. And it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uncomfortable to sit there for that amount of time to, to let them formulate and think about what they need to do. In a sense, you're noticing, like you're talking about those key words. So you're paying attention to what they're saying. You're noticing perhaps words or phrases that come up more than once. And, th yeah. and it may be that that's a key that you can reflect back to them and say, I noticed that. Could you tell me more about it and what it means to you? So you're helping them explore what's going on. Absolutely. So, right. Well, one of the reasons we should we could be careful about saying, I understand, I've been through something like that. Is their experience may be completely different, even though the detail, the, some of the details could be similar. We've got to be very, very careful about sharing our experiences, our, our being open about what we've experienced and saying, oh yeah, I've had this similar experience because it may not relate to it at all and mm -hmm. just shut down what they've just related to you um, and, and kind of sabotage the rapport that you just built with them and the trust that you just built with them instead of actually continuing it. One of the members of the church, your, your friend is going through what appears to be a really difficult time, not just a typically sad time or a typically stressful time, but a something beyond that's affecting them uh, in a more profound way, you know, they're losing a lot of sleep or they're, they're not managing to work like they normally would, or instead of having a row with their spouse once a month, it's now kind of every other day, or I don't know, but there's something sort of a bit out of control. It looks like, are there ways to draw people out? Yes. I suppose that's what I'm asking. You know, how, what, are, what are some ways you could not be intruding, but be a good friend? And be someone yep. were, you know, willing to take a risk and have to take some you know, courage in your hands because you care yep. about somebody. So you want to be lovingly concerned, but you don't want to be pushy. When I was a master sergeant um, in Iraq, we had one guy that was all of a sudden just kind of withdrawn. So I, I took him outside and uh, I was talking to him for a bit. And I said, so how are things going? I said, oh, okay. 
you know, very short answers. And I said, hey, you know, I just wanted to let you know that I really care for you. I really love you. And uh, I'm here for you. If you need anything, you let me know. And he said, well, I really appreciate that. I said, it won't go, if, if you want to talk, it won't go any further than you and me, unless you wanted to. Wanted to. And he said, okay. And it was probably a day or so later, he came back to me and he said, hey, can we go outside and talk again? I said, sure. So I, I dropped everything right away, and walked outside with him. And he said, um, I'm really having a hard time. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, the wife and I are having problems, but you know, I'm really having problems with the first sergeant. He always seems you know, down on me. He's always badgering me. He's always you know, ragging on me. He's always after me. And uh, he said, I don't know how much more I'm going to be able to take. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I think I want to end my life. I went, oh, okay. Well, you know, there are other options that you, you can do than ending your life. You got a lot more promise than that. I said, why don't we go and talk to some people about it? And I said, I'll, I'll be there with you every step of the way. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, I'll, be there. I'll do whatever you need me to do. He said, okay. So I took him over to the, to the psych, uh, chaplain first. And, uh, and then we ended up going to the psychologist. And I think that's the big thing is letting people know, not giving them advice, not telling them what to do or how to do it, but being there for them. That's a beautiful um, story, Jim. I mean, I, I see two, two main components to that. And one is that you made the offer would you like to talk? If you want to talk, I'm here. It was an offer. It was an offer based on on your own what you what you noticed. It mm -hmm. wasn't out, you know, out of, apropos of nothing. It was something that you noticed, and he must have realised that, even though he was a bit monosyllabic at that point, still he he must have known why you were making the offer. Uh, uh, but you weren't intrusive, and that gave him space to come back and, in fact, own in a sense to own his own issue. Mm -hmm. And then the other component that seemed to me particularly significant is that you offered essentially an unconditional kind of support. So that offer, a meaningful offer with a sense of really compassionate and loving support for him anyway, was, um, was the key. Right. Right. And we can do that for people. I mean, you know, not, I'm not a trained counselor. Uh, and most of us in church are not going to be in that category, but we don't have to have professional training to, to do what you've just described. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he's fine. Um, you know, he's, him and I still stay in contact on that, but uh, it, it, that is, you know, the, the, the significance is, you know, being there for somebody and letting them know that you're there for them without any conditions. You know, you're, you're not going to be, you know, saying, well, you've got to do um, but being there and letting him know that you're there anytime he needs support or she needs support um, without, you know, a moment's hesitation. You know, I'd walk him from his, his housing unit to work every morning. I'd be with him at lunch. I'd be with him anytime he wanted me to be there, especially when he was on suicide watch. Um, but at any point in time, once you build the trust and you build the rapport and you've got that, that foundation with a person, then you know that you, you're doing the right thing. You don't need to say anything. You never need to say anything. But if they know that you're there for them, that's all that matters. Yeah, it speaks to, I think, the primacy of love. Right. Love comes first, and love is never in a hurry. Nope. Right, hurry and love don't go together. No. So no. that means creating space. It means being patient. And it means withholding judgment and advice until you really have that established that level of trust and and that you hopefully the person knows they've been listened to. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, some of I do, this will vary a lot person to person. Um, I think some of us who are in a position where we could be a listener, could be a buddy, 
the difficulty for some of us is that we're afraid of that. It's it's hard. It's hard to be that giving, that available to, to people. And we may lack the courage and the compassion. We need the help from God because it's not naturally within us. That's exactly it. Right. And then I think some of us, we we have the concern but the concern is very strongly attached to a desire for justice and righteousness to prevail. And the danger with that is someone says, look, I'm, I'm really feeling quite low, more low than usual to the point where I'm not sure I, you know, I can get carry on with work and I might, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and you talk and they say, well, it's because I, I've got addicted to pornography or something. And then for a certain type of Christian, there's the, Oh, well, it's obvious then you just need to repent. You know, you need to get, throw out your pornography. You need to burn it. You need to confess yeah. everything. And, you know, and the difficulty for some Christians, I think, is because there's a place for a, a rebuke, right? I mean, there's a place for a challenge. There's a place for a correction. The Bible does talk about it. Indeed, Jesus does confront people from time to time. So there's a place for that. Um, but I think what I'm sensing, talking to you and from my own experience, is that when someone's in the middle of, of an emotional crisis or a mental health crisis, that's not the time to bring that out. Right. Maybe down the line, who knows, but not, not at the time when they are particularly vulnerable. It, 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 would you see it that way or would you see it a bit differently or how, how would you think about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, given this, this guy's particular situation and, and going through his walk with him, that he turned around to me and he said, you must think I'm a terrible person. Mm. And I said, why would you think that? What, what, what makes you think that I, I think you're a terrible person? And he said, well, because, you know, I want to take my life and, and, and I don't want to deal with these things. I said, no, I, I don't think you're a terrible person at all. I, I think you're, you're a person that has some problems that you want to deal with and, we're dealing with them together. At the end of the whole thing, he kind of turned around to me and he told me, he said, you know, if you weren't here, he said, I'd probably be dead. But with you here, I don't think I could have done it with anybody else. Hmm. And I went, well, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm glad I was here for you. Uh, because you matter. People need to know that they matter. When we're in that place of emotional turbulence or mental health challenge, we lose perspective on our value to other people and to God. Right. Right. You just, you feel like you are a terrible person or that you're beyond help or God's not with you anymore or all kinds of things. Um, and we need that someone to notice, someone to offer, someone to be a support. But you also signposted him to other people who like the chaplain i was gonna say padre that, that okay same thing <laughs> same, right yeah okay so the uh the chaplain and then the what the psychologist psychologists or, or whatever yeah. yeah so there's that component as well and i suppose that's one of the things is we we need to bear in mind as sort of average joe christians is that especially when someone's particularly disturbed it may be that you know we we can point them towards other resources whether it's you know a gp in this country at least right. uh, or or perhaps counselors or other people um that's part of our role potentially as well because we don't want to try and it doesn't help if we try and delve into something for which we have no training we want to help the people and we want to make them better and we we try to do what we can but in the same light too we may be just pushing the problem off instead of yeah. getting it resolved um and it's better to just say you know what I'll be there for you. I'll walk with you, but let's go see a professional. It takes the pressure off and allows us to be a genuine friend. Is there anything we haven't talked about that's gone through your mind? You thought, ah, I must mention this. Ask a lot of questions. Um, if you suspect mental health at all, um, ask questions, uh, seek advice about it and say, Hey, is this something that I should, you know, walk the walk with them? but you know, steer them to somebody else that has more experience, more, more education uh, in this, this area. Um, and, and certainly uh, bring them to, to those people. Don't try to tackle it yourself. 
uh, don't don't bite off more than you can chew. Make the the rapport and the trust and 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 the friendship and the love uh, that you know God expects us to do. Are there any scriptures, any verses, any examples in the Bible that particularly help you in terms of the way that you think about helping people? Oh gosh, um, all the one another scriptures okay. um, uh, definitely apply. Um, it, it, it's kind of funny that you bring that up. Uh, um, you know, Luke was a great physician. I don't know if he was in mental health or not. Um, I kind of suspect he was to a certain degree. Um, you know, Jesus obviously being the great physician, um, I think, you know, touched on mental health a lot. Um, but I think the, the one and other scriptures are really the things that draw me in uh, mostly uh, to mental health. Uh, and it doesn't matter if they're disciples or not. It doesn't matter if they have a religious background or not. Um, they're still God's children, and it still makes a difference, and it still matters. And, and that's really what kind of prompts me to go go forward. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, the one and other scriptures are really just an outworking of a Christ-like love. Yeah. If we love like Christ, we will be this way with each other. And so that's got to be the way we are, with, certainly with each other in the church. But the same principle applies to, you know, anybody we know. Exactly. Well, that ends the short version of my interview with Jim. We went for over an hour, so I'll put the longer version up online uh, a little later. But you've got the short version here. What did you think? What struck you? What did you find most inspiring? What did you find most challenging? How might you be able, now that you've heard this, to help somebody else? Or if you're going through a particularly tough time emotionally or with a mental health challenge, what did you hear from this that helped you to have confidence that God is with you, that he's with you even in the darkness, even in that darkness, it's not dark to God. He's going to be with you and is with you and loves you no matter how you're feeling and what's going on. Let me know if you've got any questions. I'll be happy to receive them. Email me at malcolm at malcolmcox.org and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Next time we have another interview, this time with two members of our sister congregation in East London. Uh, they are both 20 year plus mental health nurses and Christians and they'll be sharing next time. That's uh, Nossi and Sekai. So look forward to that. And until then, take care and God bless. <laughs>